Welcome to the Backyard Bounty Podcast from HeritageAcresMarket.com, where we talk about all things backyard poultry, beekeeping, gardening, sustainable living, and more. And now, here's your host, Nicole. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Backyard Bounty. Today we are joined by my friend Tony, and Tony owns West Creek CBD here in Howard, Colorado. And uh, Tony, you've said you've been growing industrial hemp for uh, about four years um, with some organic and regenerative farming techniques. So uh, thank you for joining us on the show today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I've been, uh, this will be our fourth season registered with the uh, Colorado Department of Agriculture to grow industrial hemp, and awesome. uh, I've always, always used uh, living organic soil and and uh, Korean natural farming techniques to grow cannabis, and uh, it, it actually works really well uh, as far as sustainability, and it's a whole bunch cheaper than using uh, synthetic nutrients. Oh, I'm sure. And, and not only cheaper, but better for everybody involved. It is better. It is. It, it gives you a cleaner, uh, higher quality product. It tends to sure. be higher and the plants tend to be higher in terpenes and cannabinoids. Uh, and they just, uh, they seem to like the soil a whole bunch more than when I used to grow when I first started out growing using uh, synthetic nutrients. Sure. I, I think that plants in general probably prefer um, organic stuff. It's it's more than what they're used to than trying to pump them full of synthetics. To me, synthetics are similar to steroids. They might they might work, but they might not necessarily be the best option. <laughs> right. Yeah. You end up with um, you end up with plants that aren't nearly as healthy as they could be. The whole kind of the whole idea of when I was introduced to it uh, was that you know the redwood forest, the soil in the redwood forest grows the largest trees in the world and so we I just try and mimic that uh that soil as much as I can uh sure in sure. Colorado we're we're not you know up here we're a little drier obviously but um yeah a little I'm bit just kind of helping nature along I try to make uh ferments out of uh aerobic ferments out of wildflowers and uh, different plants oh, wow. that are on the property. I do, do bring in some uh, different things like uh, dry amendments, like, um, you know, kelp and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, fishbone meal and uh, alfalfa and things like that. But, um, you know, as much as possible, I, I try and go out, you know, uh, from what we have on the property, we have chickens and ducks and guinea fowl that we get, we get mm -hmm. guinea fowl from you guys. And yes. <laughs> uh, so we have eggs that we then, uh, we save the shells and then uh, I'll make the shells into a, a water soluble uh, calcium uh, ferment that basically that uh, it's an extraction that you use uh, uh, vinegar to extract the calcium. And so we also have, you know, our dogs uh, will drag home bones and antlers and different things from around the, the neighborhood and I'll use those too. Uh, with vinegar and extract, uh, make a, a something called cow foss, and uh, okay. uh, so the plants really uh, enjoy that. And we're using something that's kind of laying around. So, so that brings about a million different questions to mind. You know, I've I've heard of, you know, just the use of compost before. That's you know, kind of what most people I think um, kind of default to, but. I haven't heard about, um, you said you use the wildflowers and, or wild plants and make, um, make a fertilizer with those. Yeah. So, you know, if we have wildflowers that grow on the property naturally and, you know, basically when a plant flowers, uh, it's pulling phosphorus and, uh, you know, potash out of the, uh, soil. And so in that state of flowering, it's full of those nutrients. And so basically harvesting them and you, you do like a one-to-one -one mix by weight of the plant material and brown sugar and let it ferment for about a week or a week and a half. And it just kind of extracts those, uh, nutrients out of the plant. There'll be some nitrogen in there too. And so I'll, I'll, I'll do that for, uh, spraying in early flower and then water drenching during the whole flowering process. 
And uh, so it, it, it's it's just kind of getting using what the natural uh, plants on the property are already pulling those nutrients out of the ground for me. And so. Uh, oh, that's uh, awesome. I've never heard of anything like that before, but it, I mean, it absolutely makes sense. They're, they're going to be nutrient rich. So might as well synthesize the nutrients from, from the plant themselves. Yes, exactly. And, you know, for your vegetative uh, growing state, you know, you can go and, and uh, I'll uh, harvest dandelions early before they start to flower and ferment those. And, uh, wow. So for, you know, to feed a higher nitrogen uh, fertilizer. That's, I'm, I'm almost at a loss for words already. We're five minutes in and, and <laughs> <laughs> already. You know, that's what? really cool. I've never heard of that before. It's funny because it's all, you know, I, I've learned it all of basically all of what I've learned about growing. I, I just have learned from getting on the internet and kind of researching living organic styles and different methods. And, and uh, so I, I never would have thought uh, to do that myself if I hadn't, uh, you know, seen it out there. Korean natural mm-hmm. farm is a big one with making ferments. And uh, I stay away from anaerobic ferments. There's some anaerobic ferments used in Korean natural farming that I, I tend to stay away from and try and keep everything. And why is that? Uh, you, you have a higher potential for bad types of bacteria and fungus to grow in your ferments when you're not allowing oxygen in. Okay. So, and then, and then if you end up with, with uh, you know, harmful bacteria, uh, you know, and you water it to your plants, it can actually, you know, you can end up killing your plants. If sure. Things, you know, don't go right for you. I just tend to, I don't yeah, know. Enough for, I know it. that. <laughs> <laughs> I know that uh, with like brewing kombucha and things like that, fermentation is good, but it, it can not go so great at other times and then it could be dangerous so i'm sure it's it's similar to that yes yeah and i i don't i'm not like a i don't know all the science behind it you know but i uh i just well, I, it seems to be working for you though it, it's working at this point yeah it's been it's been working well for uh well and it it's probably i think it's been a little over four years uh i since i started growing using the, the mm-hmm. natural methods. And then, you know, it was shortly after that, that I got licensed to grow hemp. So all my hemp's always been grown, grown that way. Yeah, we use a, a lot awesome. of cover crops too, uh, alfalfa and clovers and things. I do that even indoors. Uh, oh, really? And uh, they just have a, the cover crop serves to kind of break the soil up and uh you know, if, if you've got uh, alfalfa or clover, uh, they'll actually pull nitrogen from the air and deposit it into the soil for you. And then I assume before you um, use the soil, then you just till till the cover crops in? I kind of do a thing they call uh, chop and drop, where I'll come through and just chop it down and just let it, uh, let it fall where it does and decompose okay. it. And I try not to do any real tilling at all when I First, we have two acres, and I've got a half acre licensed, and we've got. Mm-hmm. Uh, so our field was basically it was it was never farmed on before, and the first season I just planted the hemp straight in the ground, and it it didn't do very well. It was very hard packed and and hadn't been shown any attention at all. And, and so the next season, what I did was I had a guy come in and drill, eighteen inch holes, basically about. A foot and a half to two feet deep and I went out and there's a organic dairy farm here in Howard and so I went over and got she's just got a, a mix of of uh you know cow dumpings and hay basically and I got that and I filled all the holes in the field with that and then since then I haven't done any tilling or, or, or anything of the soil uh the most I end up doing is going out there with a a, a land rake on the tractor and just kind of dragging it across the field to pull out any tumbleweeds or anything that's grown over the winter uh, or in the early spring and so I, I haven't really done a whole lot of tilling at this point I just try and kind of feed the soil from above and try not to disturb the soil you know web the food web that starts to grow beneath it the more uh, mycorrhizae that you allow to grow uh, under the soil the better. As soon as you start tilling, you end up, um, you end up kind of destroying that network. And it, that network is kind of like the internet for plants. So 
anything that's planted in the ground on the earth, it's all connected. Grasses, trees, everything is connected. Mm -hmm. And you'll have a tree, uh, say, get some sort of disease or something. And what it does is it sends out signals to the surrounding trees that it's getting sick. And then the surrounding trees will start to produce, uh, you know, what, whatever they can to fight, to fight the disease. And so if, with the idea of the living organic soil is you don't want to uh, disrupt that uh, network uh, as much as possible. That's, that's one of the neatest things I think I've heard in a, lot, a long yeah, time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy I, to think that they're communicating, trees are communicating with each other like that. You know, I'm taking a, a class right now, and they said that uh, plants communicated with um, different uh, things like vibrations and pheromones. And, and like you said, you wouldn't think that, that plants communicate to each other. You think they're just a standalone thing that's just there, but r really they are a living creature just like everything else. But I didn't realize that they could communicate through the ground and, and communicate diseases and stuff. Yeah, I, you know, and I, it, it makes sense. Uh, you know, that they would try and develop uh, some sort of, of way to battle disease, you know, over the the millennia, millions and millions of years. And uh, I never had any idea of it until I started reading about all this stuff. But then once I did, it just made so much sense that uh, they would be communicating like that and trying to save themselves uh, from sure. invasive species or or you know, fungus, though there's all kinds of different, you know, pests yeah. that come in. So when you say regenerative farming, which is a difficult thing for me to, to pronounce, is that kind of this all encompassing, you know, with, with keeping the soil intact and the use of um, like your, your wildflower nutrients, is that kind of what you mean by that? Yeah, yeah, totally. And, just basically working with the soil to regenerate it. Uh, you know, the, the way that we've been farming as a culture in the United States for the last 150 years, it, it drains the soils of uh, the, the normal natural nutrients that are there. And what you end up with are these, these fields that are drained completely of nutrients. And so they're forced to feed uh, synthetic nutrients to these crops to get them to grow. Whereas with the regenerative farming, you're just pretty, you're, you're, you're trying to create a, a situation where there's a lot of organic material being decomposed in the field. And that this idea that you don't have to add any synthetics to it, if you just keep the soil healthy, the soil life healthy, it'll, it'll work for itself and every year it will become better. My field now, uh, after this will be the fourth season, now when I walk out there, even the, the spots that weren't drilled and had the um, compost put in, it's starting to, to soften up and break down and become more of a, a kind of loamy soil, uh, even in that short period of time. And, you know, I've, I've watched a video on YouTube, and I'm not going to remember be able to remember this guy's name, but he talked about, you know, over a course of 10 years, you can totally reverse a, a farm that's been, uh, you know, incorrectly grown on for for decades and decades with just using these, these, uh, methods. That's awesome. And I guess it really makes sense if you think about it, you know, in nature, the plants would grow and die and decompose and you'd have different animals coming through and eating and making their own deposits. And, you know, it, it would kind of just obviously naturally regenerates itself and then forest fires and stuff like that. And, you know, traditional farming, just kind of strips of the land of everything and then leaves it pretty devoid and then um, kind of, you know, not really beneficial in the end. And then I can see how, how we can put ourselves in a predicament like that with, um, with totally just destroying the soil. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're, uh, you know, now we're seeing, uh, you know, when you, if you're, if you're going to the store and buying um, mass produced, vegetables or fruits or anything like that they're not going to be nearly as nutrient dense as as, mm -hmm. as you know vegetables or fruits that are grown in, in a regenerative soil basically 
So it's not even as the food sure. is not even as healthy for us. Yeah, I know that um, I had read something or or seen something along the lines of, I mean, eating vegetables is great. And even if you eat organic vegetables, if the soil isn't healthy, then neither are going to be your fruits or vegetables or what you harvest from the land. Right. Exactly. And uh, so and any time that you've got um, any any time that you just like the, the plants, if you're not growing them in a healthy soil, uh, they're not the plants themselves are not going to be healthy. And so it, it, it adds to your pest problems. Uh, it adds to the susceptibility to powdery mildew and, and botrytis and things like that. But humans are the same exact way. We, sure. if we're not eating healthy food, we'll end up with more diseases. And I think that's what we're seeing with, uh, you know, rise in disease and, and obesity and things is people are eating fast food and, and uh, chock full of sugar. And, and, and so it's the same to us. If we're not eating healthy, we're, we're going to be more susceptible to diseases like cancer and things like that. And that's the same with the plants. So all, all the way around, uh, you know, regenerative farming can help. Uh, lower disease and help with people's overall general health. And then that sure. goes I, even further to mental health too. Yep. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's one of the things that I've found so interesting when I've started to really get into gardening and beekeeping and all this stuff is you don't, um, you don't realize how everything plays to, together, not only in nature, but it makes you realize that in your own body, like you said, you know, you can only be so healthy if you're eating a fast food hamburger every day. And that's another thing I could talk about for hours, but um, you know, really they are very similar and we need to treat our bodies better than we are if we're going to um, be truly healthy. And, and like you said, even in the level of mental health, I know that they think um, a lot of diseases or behavioral issues could actually be more so um, malnutrition and not so much like you're starving, but you're, you're lacking macronutrients and stuff that you're really don't have this mental health, you know, depression or whatever. It's just, you don't have a sufficiently fed body. And so it starts to manifest itself in different diseases. Absolutely. I, I believe that's absolutely true. And unfortunately, we're, yep. uh, you know, I don't know if we'll see major changes for everyone uh, in the near future, but I, I think those people that are aware of it tend to, uh, you know, try and eat a little healthier and stay away from uh, pharmaceuticals and stay away from fast food. I know mm -hmm. that's, we try to do that. I don't know. We're not always as good as we should be about it over here, but sure. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, we try to be. So, uh, yeah, we, uh, we were a small farm. Uh, we, uh, I have no employees. My wife works a full-time job. Uh, we have a oh, uh, really? nine-year-old son. And so she helps around the farm a little bit, but basically everything's done here just by me at the farm. And, uh, you know, I, I like to tell people if you're, uh, you know, considering, uh, growing hemp, but you don't have large acreage, it can still be done and you can still make, um, a fairly good living on a small piece of land if you're willing to grow the hemp and extract the oil and make products yourself uh, to retail. It, it's uh, something that can be done uh, on very small piece of land. So I always encourage people. To... So for... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I think we, I kind of had some communication like kind of cut out a little bit oh. there. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> So for um, maybe those that might not be familiar, can you explain the difference between hemp and cannabis or marijuana or whatever you would like to call it? So, yeah, it's uh, it's all cannabis and hemp is considered by the federal government to uh, it's it, it's considered hemp if it's below 0.3 percent THC on a dry weight basis. And then. Okay. So THC is the psychoactive cannabinoid that people always hear about that gets you high. And there's mm -hmm. hundreds, there's, I think 144 cannabinoids that we know of, uh, CBD and THC being the two main cannabinoids. 
so the hemp is just high in CBD and then low in THC. And, and then, you know, your other cannabis that's grown for recreational and, and medical shops is going to be uh, much higher in THC, sometimes up to 30%. And usually in those strains, uh, you don't see a whole lot of, of CBD because over the years it, it was it was bred out because it's not psychoactive. And when it was a part of the black market, um, you know, people wanted to grow strong uh, cannabis for sale. And uh, we're kind of finally getting mm -hmm. back around to, you know, with this industrial hemp, the idea that these other cannabinoids have a place and and uh, can help us. And and so what we grow is, is all industrial hemp. Um, registered with the Colorado Department of Agriculture and you know you have to give them a GPS point on your property in the center of, of, of your registered grow and then inside your uh, registered grow you can only have plants that are below 0.3 percent THC. And do you test for that? Is, is that something, how do you know what your percentage So are? you you know want if you're thinking about buying uh, hemp genetics you, gotta, you, you should find a you need to do some research and, and find a good a good company that has good genetics uh, and and then basically grow it out yourself and, and test it the state does some testing uh, they'll come usually uh, for the outdoor season they'll come in early September and test your field they don't test everyone they, they just don't have the manpower or time to get around and test all the farms in, in, in Colorado but you can be tested is the idea that, you know, they could come and test. And so it's important if it's over 0.3% THC and under 1%, you're just not allowed to sell that uh, harvest, basically. So if you were looking to sell it and, you know, make a living off it, it would, you know, basically, you know, would ruin your whole season. And then if it's above 1%, they can turn mm -hmm. you over to the local law enforcement and you can be uh you know charged with with growing you know cannabis basically with thc cannabis and you then you can face all the, the different things sure. that come along with uh getting arrested for that and jail time and fines and things so it's important to find uh good genetics and and ask the person that's selling you either clones or seed to show you a, a certificate of analysis a coa of what you're buying just to see that you know what you're getting is 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 a legitimate uh, genetic, and you won't be wasting your your time or possibly uh, jeopardizing your your freedom. Sure, yeah, that would be uh, an unfortunate. Yes, outcome. and I haven't heard of anyone <laughs> so, uh, having issues of over one percent, uh, but I have heard of plenty of farms that have tested hot over 0.3, and then basically mm -hmm. they just they either either have to destroy uh, their their harvest or that you can only personally use it. Okay. So I know you kind of um, introduced me to the world of CBD. It was something that being uneducated was kind of new and scary. But when I had my shoulder surgery last year, you know, I, I don't like taking opiates for some of the reasons that we talked about earlier. I don't like to put, um, you know, chemically manufactured things in my body if I can avoid it. And opiates kind of uh, scare me a little bit. Um, so you had given me some CBD salve or, or lotion to use for pain management. And I liked that, you know, it, it worked great for pain, but as you said, didn't have any of the psychoactive effects, which was wonderful because that wasn't what I was after. So what are some of the other benefits of CBD? Uh, I really, it, it's, uh, it's really good at uh, reducing inflammation, extremely good, even topically uh, for people that are worried about, um, you know, you can take tinctures internally and that kind of thing. Uh, there's a few different types of CBD that you'll see in the stores. Uh, one is, is an isolate which is 99% CBD and it doesn't contain any THC. Uh, you'll see some distillates that are uh, higher in, you know, 80 to 90% uh, CBD and they'll, they'll remove the THC. I, I use a, personally use a full spectrum oil that's, I use, uh, I extract using alcohol. Uh, some people call it a Rick Simpson oil and uh, Rick Simpson oil is 
was originally made with THC, but uh, I just used the same recipe. And so I have, I, I save all the terpenes and different cannabinoids that are present, including the THC. And then when I uh, make my products, I include, you know, there's a, there's a trace amount of THC. I think there's been studies done in Israel that uh, show that you, you need a, a bit of a trace of THC even uh, to open the receptors in your endocannabinoid system to accept CBD. And so I, mm -hmm. all my products are made uh, containing a trace amount of THC. And, um, you know, some people have to do drug tests for work or things like that. And they worry about, you know, is, is there's possibly some THC in here. Could I uh, test positive? And uh, we've, we had a, had a guy whose mom was in Nebraska and doesn't smoke any THC cannabis at all. And so for, I think it was three months, over three months, she took uh, my tincture every day. And then once a month, she'd take a drug test and she never came up positive for THC. Uh, so that's a positive as far as people that are worried about, you know, possibly having that issue by taking, uh, you know, taking CBD products. But I, I highly suggest to people that are out and about looking for THC products, not to buy them from gas stations or uh, any type of, of store like that. Try and find an, a good, uh, you know, small batch farm, uh, com you know, company that, that creates T uh, CBD products with a trace amount of, of THC in them. They'll, they'll be a lot more viable and, and uh, they'll work a lot better for you, basically. Yeah, I know that when I used the CBD, I was worried about the trace THC, but, um, you know, a lot of those UAs, they have a threshold, so they, they don't test for any THC. You have to reach a certain amount. So as long as you're below that amount, which you will be with the CBD, then it, it's not an issue. And then I know that I've also been seeing CBD pop up everywhere, stores everywhere. I even, by my work, there's a roadside, like, they're literally next to the snow cone stand and they're selling yes. CBD oil. And so of course you don't know where that's coming from and it's, and it's sort of concerning. So I know you guys obviously sell the CBD products and that's available on your website. Is that something that you guys are able to ship and can you ship outside of Colorado? How does that work for those that might be interested in, in trying? Yes. Yeah, so products? we are able to ship, uh, across the country now. Uh, we've been shipping for years. Uh, the Postal Service had basically, there was a farm in Colorado that was shipping large amounts of, of CBD extracts around the country. And the Postal Service confiscated one or two of their shipments and they took the Postal Service to court and they sued, they sued the okay. Postal Service. Uh, saying that, you know, it's been, uh, you know, federally legal since uh, 2014. And then uh, in 2018, uh, just after Christmas, uh, Donald Trump signed the 2018 Farm Bill and it officially removed uh, CBD and uh, industrial hemp derived uh, oils from the Controlled Substances Act, basically. From So... They won this court case, and so now it's absolutely 100% legal to ship CBD products and receive them in the mail. People do not have to worry uh, about having any uh, any issues with law enforcement or uh, or the postal service confiscating their order. Uh, it's good to send test results with the package in case the post office decides to open it and see what's in it. Uh, it's good to send some test results along, uh, saying what it is and how it tests so on the spot they can see that it's it's a legal product but uh again it's good to do your research I, I tell people you know you don't have to buy it from me but you do need to do some research and find uh, a good uh, legitimate uh, company that's 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 using uh, full spectrum oils and extracts to make their products awesome, awesome. And uh, we'll put a link in this description for anybody that would like to check out your store. Um, and like I said, I've, I've used your products and I can attest to how wonderful they are. And I definitely a fan of them. So I'm, I'm so excited that I was able to uh, be introduced to that world. Well, through thank you. you. 
and I know, <laughs> yeah, of course. And I know that um, you guys also believe in giving back to the community and all that as well. So you're going to be at the Stomp Out Epilepsy event. Yes, that's in Denver. It's a um, it's a walk and, and run to to raise money for the Chelsea Hutchinson Foundation. Uh, I have a cousin in in Nebraska whose son has epilepsy, and over the Thanksgiving holiday, we were there, and he had a seizure, and and we um, provided them with some different CBD oils and products to try and and uh, help him uh, kind of get away from some of the pharmaceuticals that, that that he's on there. And so they had a gala uh, last weekend uh, in in Denver uh, to raise money, and my cousin was nice enough to buy us some tickets, and we went up and uh, got to do dinner and, and meet some people and meet the uh, people that run the foundation, and uh, I offered to give them some of our products to uh, auction that evening, but they had already had everything set up, and so I'd, I'd uh, we talked about us coming to the setting up a a table basically at the uh, at their run, and so I think we're gonna be out there for that and and uh, kind of get try and get the word out a little bit, and we look forward to uh, helping their foundation uh, as much as we can. <laughs> That's awesome. We must give back, <laughs> you know. <laughs> of course, I think that's responsible. Uh, just being responsible business owners and just good people is to try to try to give back. You know, the whole idea possible. of what we do is is um, is to try and be beneficial to people who are uh, tired of using conventional pharmaceuticals uh, to treat different uh, issues that they're having, and um, you know, since we don't sell any type of of high thc product at all it's it's for us it's never been about a recreational uh use or anything like that and so it it is about helping and and uh you know the fda doesn't allow us to make any any claims about what our products are are capable of uh, but i know personally when i use them that i experience a lot of relief and i've had a lot of different customers experience relief um all the way from uh you know children with cancer uh, up to just very, you know, regular daily aches and, and, and pains. Uh, there has been some evidence that um, CBD and THC are, are capable of uh, killing cancer cells. And that's very interesting and exciting to me to hopefully when in the future, we'll see legitimate studies done and some real money spent uh, trying to, um, you know, explore that further uh, and, and and really actually be able to help people instead of what the pharmaceutical industry tends to do, which is make money off of of people's suffering and, and diseases. So I'm excited mm-hmm. uh, where that could go. Yeah, that's awesome. I know that I've seen those studies as well, and and I think that that would be just incredible if we could, uh, you know, find a cure for cancer or, um, you know, with with cannabis. Yeah, products. absolutely, and and. Even uh, just as simple as making a person in later stages more comfortable and, and not having to deal with the side effects of heavy narcotic opioid use and what comes, everything that comes along with that. Uh, it's, it's certainly, um, you know, has the potential to uh, help with pain management in a way that, that the opioids certainly uh, aren't capable of. Yep. And that's, that's, we see that all the time when people are at end of life and they're very heavily medicated on opiates. Yeah. They won't even be awake. Uh, they miss the last right. few days uh, with their family and uh, cannabis has the potential right. to change that and allow them to spend that time uh, in, in uh, you know, with yeah. their families being conscious and, and present. So. Sure. Yeah, that's um, definitely some exciting stuff on the yeah, horizon. Yeah, I, I think. would love to see it go the go the right way and be dealt with correctly by the federal government. And, and uh, you know, I don't have much say in any of that, but uh, it, it has the yeah. potential <laughs> for us. To see good things come from that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, that's. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I don't really have 
any other burning questions floating around in my mind is do you have anything else that you would like to well to i add? think i've got it got it all out there uh just make sure if you're buying just make sure if you're buying cbd products to do some research and find a a, a good company that's doing the right thing and uh, using the right uh, extracts and and uh you know i'm always open to uh communication uh through the website uh Anytime, if people have questions about products or uh, what they can possibly be used for, I am always open uh, to speak with people and uh, tell them what knowledge I have. Awesome. That's great. Um, and where else can people find you other than uh, Right now, we're uh, in Salida, Colorado. Uh, Salida Hydroponic Supply carries our, our full line of products and Simple Foods carries our salves and tinctures. Uh, you can also get our salves at Vital Living in uh, downtown uh, Salida. That's my sister-in-law. She runs a, a health food supplement store down there, and she actually makes around 200 products of her own uh, in there. And uh, She's got a great, oh, wow. huge, uh, great store down there on F Street. Uh, we are not a uh, good weed company in Colorado Springs, carries some of our uh, vape cartridges and a couple of other products too. So, but uh, we'd like to see ourselves uh, in some more retail uh, stores, but uh, at this point, we're not quite there yet. Sure. And then if they wanted to get a hold of you, um, they can shoot you an email through your website, which like I said, we'll put a link. And then I know you're on Instagram because I totally geek out on your pictures. On a daily <laughs> Thank basis. you. Yeah. West Creek City Connection on Instagram is a good place to go to see. Uh, it's a, it's a whole history of my company and, and how I grow and different methods I use and, and pictures of, you know, of the farm and, and what we do. So yeah, that's another good place. I've done a, done a lot of business on Instagram and Instagram has been good to me as, as far as awesome. my name out there. And that's awesome. uh, we do sell seeds also. Uh, uh, we can, if people oh, okay. are looking for seeds uh, to grow their own hemp, whether it be uh, on a large scale or just in a small grow room for their own use. Uh, we do that. And uh, we also have access to clones too, uh, if, if people are interested. Awesome. Well, um, th yeah, that's some fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to chat with us and explain to us um, your amazing growing um, techniques. I think this, the soil stuff is super interesting, and I'm definitely going to have to do some more research into that because I want to learn Absolutely. more Absolutely. There is a ton of information out there. There's a, a good book uh, called Teeming with Microbes by uh, Jeff Lowenfels, I believe that has just a ton of information about regenerative soil and uh, living organic soil. So that's another cool. source of information. Cool. Google's uh, got it all. It's got all the information you want to find. Yes, they do. <laughs> cool. Well, um, yeah, I'll definitely check that out. And then, um, yeah, if anybody that has any questions, feel free to, of course, give Tony uh, an email and uh, check out his amazing CBD products. They're um, they're the best on the market, if you ask me. Thank you. And um, yeah, so thank you again yeah, for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to Backyard Bounty, a podcast by HeritageAcresMarket.com. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show please email us at ask at heritageacresmarket.com. Also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Heritage Acres Market. All the links mentioned in this podcast will be included in the description. See you again next week.